Too late. All right, here we go. Week three. One more week to go. And you still have to put an engine together. Oh, man. Yikes. It's still too. Yeah. <laughs> sure. I'd wait till next week to start. Huh. All right. We're going to talk about the top end plus the valve train this week. That should, like, do something. There we go. All right. The top end plus valve train. Got it? Good. That is not a picture I want to look at. There we go. Let's start with pistons. Piss what? Pistons. Pistons. Well, we could probably really just abbreviate this whole week and just go, well, look in the parts book or the service bulletin and get the right stuff. But as you're kind of learning, that it actually doesn't work out that well, does it? So, oh, plus I don't think I didn't have a chance to rewrite my, um, uh, what do you call it, outline here. So it's kind of messed up. So, all right, a piston. A piston uh, is a plunger, is a plunger that moves up and down that moves up and down in the cylinder a lot of you are still calling this a head this is not a cylinder head this is a cylinder a cylinder um, Barrel. Barrel. Uh, it transmits. It. It transmits. Force. Force of the burning and expanding gases. Um, in the cylinder, in the cylinder, to the connecting rod. Next class, we're going to talk a lot about this burning process, the fuel, the air mixture, how it all works in the cylinder. But for right now, we're just going to say, hey, there, fuel air goes in, it's ignited, expands, presses on the piston. Because you can't cover everything all at once. All right, so pressure is about... One book I saw has it at about, I'll put about, about 500 PSI. I have some that uh, show it a little bit lower, so that gives me a range, range of 300 to over 1,000 PSI. Oh man, off topic, but not too far. I don't know what I was on a website in there, you know, that ads, and it was an ad for aircraft engines, and it caught my eye. Do you know what a TIO 540 for a Cessna 206 is running right now? TIO. Turbocharged injected opposed. Turbocharged. That was on the test, <laughs> week one. Yeah, no, that would be a hell of a bargain. Oh. $207,000. Well, unless you had a core. If you had a reusable core to send back, it was only 177000 Only 30000 Yeah, an 0470, like for my 182, was 54000 <clears throat> Now, I tell you this. We don't buy airplanes. To tell you that, yeah. <laughs> people, people say they don't have an airplane. I go, well, what do you do? Where do you send all your money? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's only $200,000. <laughs> you, you, yeah, that's child's play. Um, I want you to think about that when you're working on somebody's airplane. You know, it's you know, mine, you know, 1977. It's like, oh my gosh, it's an old freaking thing over there. You know, uh, show some respect because 
if somebody pulled up in a Ferrari or Lamborghini, be like, oh my gosh, just be careful. Don't even, you know, walk too close for food, scratch it. Things are becoming like child's play of money when it comes to some of these aircraft. I mean, it's insane. So I get all weirded out when people are like working on, on these planes. They're not careful if their screwdrivers are scratching them. They're poking the interior with their tools in their back pocket. They do a compression test, write it across the valve covers. It's like, ah, oh, man, don't do that. So anyway, off topic, but hopefully. All right. Uh, these pistons are made of, made of money. Um, of aluminum alloy, um, the heads of the piston, so heads of the piston are thicker than automotive, are they? So if you think about using an automotive piston, don't. So why are they thicker? Well, um, one, because um, auto auto engines are water cooled, and when you water cool an engine, you get tighter tolerances. You have a much more control over the heat process. And it kind of tends to run at a more stable temperature. So we have air cooled engines which have a wider range of temperature. I don't know. As a kid, I was always taught that that was a big difference when we were into motorcycles, going from an wa air-cooled motorcycle to water-cooled. I don't know if it's true, but it was, yeah, when you get into water-cooled, all the tolerances are tighter, you can put more power out of it and stuff. So, uh, what do you think over there, Michael? I agree. Okay. Michael's done a lot of, a lot of auto stuff. Um, because auto are water-cooled and aircraft are air-cooled. Most of them, not all of them. Um, talk about the material. Um, let's see. Majority of them are, I don't know, I'm getting off in the weeds here, but majority. Majority are forged pistons, are forged. And they're at a 4130 material, or sorry, 4140, not that you care, 4140. That's a type of aluminum, which I think you should have already had with Phil, who explained that type of stuff. Mm. Um, and then we have cast. Some may be cast out of a 132 material. And then you're going to ask, well, what's the difference between forging and casting? And so I thought, well, I should mention that right now. Um, let's see. So forging versus casting. So if it's cast, cast, material is heated above its melting point and poured into a mold where it solidifies. So heated or, or melted and poured. Yeah, poured. That's what I am after I buy an aircraft engine. I'm very poured. Or forged. It is physically forced into shape while remaining in a solid state, although it's frequently heated. So we'll say forced into shape. Forced into shape. Um, forgings have less surface porosity, finer grain structure, higher tensile strength, better fatigue life strength, and greater ductility than casting. So forgings are... Uh, less surface porosity. Um, finer grain. Uh, we'll just put higher strength. And uh, better fatigue life. That's good enough. Oh, it does. It would definitely work hard in it. And you'd kind of want that. But you have to kind of think it through a little bit. It's like, wow, it's hard to believe they could take a piston 
and do all that, get the ring groups. Well, no, it's like forged into an, for lack of a better term, an ingot, or, because that's not the word I want to use, because that's like way before they're called ingots and the ingots, steel ingots are made into, into what we have. A, a billet, I guess? No, that's still too far in the process. Anyway, it's formed in this chunk. And I, you probably didn't really catch on to it. I did because when I was at Lycoming School, they talked a lot about their piston machine. And they showed it in that movie that we had, that, that but not, well, it was not a movie, yeah. but yeah, the Vidya, thank you, because it was short. There was no popcorn involved, so it was a video. And uh, they talk about how awesome it was. They take this, these forged pieces of aluminum, kind of stick it in, in this end, and then you just walk down the other end, have a smoke, and out comes a perfect piston. And uh, the guy teaching the class said the machine hardly ever works. It was such a pain in the butt. It mm -hmm. gave him so many, so much problems. It probably works now, but according to him, it was like this big pain. Um, but to Lycoming's credit, it's their machine and they have control over it. Otherwise, you're just sending off for parts in other countries and we're talking about aircraft parts. And of course, you can imagine what happens when a piston fails. When a piston fails, the engine's gone. I mean, it's just toasted. The best case scenario, you just launched a bunch of aluminum into the engine that it's going to require major overhaul. That's best case scenario. Worst case scenario is they're gonna crash, which is very bad. Um, all right. Got some weird words in here. Trunk versus slippers. Trunk is what you wear in this area and the slippers what you put on your feet. That's what I know. Um, so aviation pistons. Are the trunk type. And then I wonder, well, what the heck is that? Because sometimes I find these things, I'm like, well, that's interesting. So what, is it, what does that mean? So trunk type, T-Y-P, trunk type, uh, pistons, transmit the side load to the cylinder wall. Well, they may not mean a whole lot, but if you're working on these things and you think about it, like, wow, you know, so you have the piston pin on the other side, there's quite a load there that's actually going to be transmitting side to side along the, uh, the cylinder wall. So you get dirt and material in there, you'll get scuffing up and down your pistons, which is a bad thing. So it would also tell me that oil on the cylinder walls is very important. So we can well, I'm thinking about that. So let me see about the piston. <clears throat> How much oil do you burn in your car? Not much. Not much. <laughs> you at home. Not huh? much. Yeah, not very, very little. It's like, yeah, I remember my, you know, father-in-law, hey, every Saturday you get up and you check the oil in your car. That's what you do. Mm. I'm like, dude, I never check the oil in my car anymore because you get tired of doing it because every time you go check it, it's just fine, right? Unless you're driving something pretty old. So uh, our cars burn very, very little oil. Enough that probably nobody in here adds any oil in between your oil changes. You're like, good, all the way to the oil change. And uh, who's got the trip counter in your car where you reset it when you put gas in, it tells you the hours and the miles? Okay, so where you go about 400 miles to the gas tank? And how many hours is that? Okay, I, I, I've got pictures. I used to do it all the time in my other car so I know exactly how much it was and then I forgot. So yeah, seven to 10 hours or something like that. So, um, Let's say it's uh, 10 hours and you go 400 miles. So uh, do that times five and you have 50 hours on your engine, right? And so you would go 2,000 miles. So that would be changing your oil every 2,000 miles if it was a, an airplane. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we're changing oil a lot. And it would not be unreasonable to add one quart for every 10 hours, that would be fine. 
uh, or less. Some people are doing a quart. Would you guys know what your how many hours you get to quart? Okay. New cylinders. Yeah. Still figure it out. Yeah, I can. I can run about 25 hours. I don't like that. That's too many. But, uh, um, but yeah, depending on the flying, 10 to 15 before I start looking at adding oil. So, but you know, if you think about that, that's uh, what for the car that'd be the equivalent of adding uh, four quarts. So change your change your oil every 2,000 miles. And by the time you got to 2,000 miles, you just put four quarts in it. That's the entire oil capacity of my Subaru. Oh, yeah. You would not be happy with this performance, would you? As we're in an aircraft, you're like, damn, man, you get 10 hours for every quart? Oh, that's a damn good engine. So we burn a lot of oil. And, in fact, I made a comment, well, yeah, sometimes I'm going upwards towards, like, in the close to 20 hours before I'm putting a quart in. I don't like that. That's not good. Our engines burn oil they're designed to burn oil if you're not burning oil it means you are rubbing your top end so that but i have a big bore continental and my experience with them is they just eat top ends where i showed you guys where that ring step is continentals get it real bad like homing's not as bad uh, just with, with your engine does it hold oil better if your plane can hold eight quarts does it like six or seven more? Yeah, so that's just, that's a huge thing I'd look into. Mine holds 12, and I usually put in 10 or 11 quarts at oil change. So the sump holds 12, the engine holds some, and then, of course, the oil filter is large. It holds, you know, half a quart at least. So, I don't know, I'll let it go to eight quarts. Um... But there's this, this thing in aviation which just blew my mind uh, when I first got into it. <clears throat> so you do an oil change. You know, you're a new guy doing an oil change, right? Because that's what you guys do. And so, you know, you look at the dipstick and, you know, it says, well, it needs eight quarts, which is very common for light coming. Eight quarts. Well, if your car takes four quarts, how many do you put in? Four. And a half, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, 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 this four is not very much. So, you know, it's an airplane looking at eight quarts. How many quarts should I put in? Six. Eight. Well, then the customer comes in. You put how much in there? Well, eight. So it's around the di quantity. Eight quarts. Eight quarts. You know. Oh, don't do that, man. It's just going to blow it out. You mean it's just going to blow it out? You know? Then you start hearing that over and over. Well, you know, you learn real quick. You know, how many quarts do you want in there? Oh, only put in six. Put in eight. It'll blow it out. And everybody says that. And then, of course, you know, I when I bought my airplane and, you know, checked the oil before I'm leaving, the guy's like, oh, there's only eight quarts. Don't put in 12. It'll blow it out. Well, yeah, it'll blow it out, though tax seal is what it's blowing out of the whole damn time um so i did some research and reading and it's like where does this come from this whole put oil in and it blows it out um a lot of it has to do with because in a car the car manufacturer can put a certain sump on because of the clearance in the engine figure it out and say you know this is how it's going to run and this is going to work and if it doesn't they can change it do whatever they want well, when an aircraft engine's certified, that's why it's certified. That's how many quarts it got certified with. You can't just go changing it just because it went in this other airframe. So, number one, you've got that problem. Um, so, if the engine configuration is a little different, it sits a little different, the oil sloshes around different. So, they can't just change it. So, certified with 12, so that's, that's what, what I get. You guys have eight, right? And that's what you get. Um, so, we don't have a rebreathing system like cars do. Our crankcases are just vented. You put drill a hole in the crankcase, run a pipe, go overboard. So any pressure built in the crankcase just goes out. Mm -hmm. So when you're running your engine and we're splashing this oil all over the place, it's this heavy, misty, uh, mist, oil mist in this air. And so we create pressures from the cylinders. It goes past the rings that fills the crankcase up with pressure. It's just what it does because you have ring blow by. Pressurizes the crankcase, which pushes air out the breather tube with all of this oil saturated air and that it blows out and that's just a fact well you couple that with the fact that with your car you don't do this <laughs> all right so when we go up and we're you know going at a pretty steep angle that oil does slosh to the back where we have gears rotating and turning and so that creates even more splash and sometimes your uh, breather tube is near the rear and it tends to really want to dump it out. So that is sort of a truth that some airplanes will seek a certain level. So if you just 
built, be put in 12 courts, it may blow out the first one or two. You know, it's just people know their aircraft, they know what it takes, and that's just, you just do it. So. All right, uh, let's see. Side of the cylinder, yeah, that was kind of off the wall there. Let me see. Um, the slipper pistons. And I really wanted a good picture of slipper versus trunk. I couldn't find one. Um, they have reduced size. One, have reduced size and weigh as little as possible. <coughs> and we're not so much worried about, I guess, the weight in this particular situation. So we do that. Um, I don't know. I left this in here, so I'll just talk about it. Pistons must be somewhat lightweight. Can't be made out of steel. Although they can be, because I remember as a kid, we had a piston out of a train. I think it was steel. Is that possible? I, mean, I remember I couldn't hardly move it. Big diesel train. I think it was steel or something. It was just like enormous. Um, all right, must be lightweight. Oh, do they? That's pretty cool. Okay. Um, so I don't know. I'm going to put a little asterisk on this. You know, it's something people, somebody said one time. I picked it up somewhere and I wrote it. It's not just my opinion. They said, oh, it must be lightweight. And they said, well, it's constantly starting and stopping. So if it's constantly starting and stopping, it should be lightweight. And there is truth to that. It does start and stop. Uh, but it's not an abrupt stop. It speeds up and slows down at the end and speeds up and slows down at the end. So um, anyway, I'll just put that. So constant starts and stops I can't leave out too much because sometimes I uh, put stuff in here and it ends up being a QA and a question like oh I shouldn't have constant start stops oh I forgot and uh, direction reversals obviously um, so at 2000 RPM it would have 4000 starts and stops a minute apparently so um, this is important though, and I think this would be the best reason why I'd want an aluminum piston. Must have high heat transferability. Yeah, heat transfer. We got to get the heat from the combustion that is heating that piston up away from the piston. Got to get it out of there. And aluminum um, has a very high uh, heat conductivity, more than steel does which means that it transfers heat across very, very fast. Where steel would stay hot, uh, aluminum transfers it out. Which is why I believe that we have aluminum heads, this is the head, you can say that now, and steel barrels down here. Because the aluminum up there is where it's hot and it's transferring the heat out more. So temp, temp inside cylinder, uh, reaches, I don't know about this number, 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That just seems crazy, but I guess it's probably true. The air leaving the cylinder is 1,700 degrees. That's after combustion. Yeah, that must mean the, the remaining degrees leaves the actual head. What's that? If it's like 2,000, and then you said it's 4,000 on the inside. Yeah. Yeah, it must go into the actual material of the, the aluminum, the head, I'm assuming. We'll go, the head, there? Yeah, yeah top part. So yeah. the piston gets the heat, it transfers it to the rings, mm -hmm. Without the rings, there'd be no heat transfer. The piston would just melt. So the rings are really important to transfer the heat to the cylinder walls, from the cylinder walls mm -hmm. to the cooling fins on the barrel and the head. Right. So, well, side note here, aluminum melts at 12, 1220. 
I think it melts before that. I was messing with some aluminum in a kiln and I melted a bunch of it. I think I was well below that, but that was that particular. Um, oh, look what I talk about next. Heat transfer. It's free type of heat transfer. I'm not going to write it. You know what it is? Convection, conduction, and radiation. So convection, kind of, you got a stove at or oven at home? I have an oven at home. Most of you do. You guys look at me like, I don't know, my mom cooks for me. Yeah, how many, how many, your, your mom still cooks for you. Yeah, nah, so convection oven. You have a convection oven? I do. So a you have a regular oven, and that same oven is also a convection oven. The difference is when I put on a convection oven, there's a little fan in the back that blows air around. Mm. That's convection, air blowing. So that's how I remember it, convection, a convection oven. It's blowing air inside. That's what it is. So convection, heat transfer by means, uh, by mass motion of a fluid such as air or water. So if you have air blowing across it, there you go. You've got what? Convection. Convection. Um, conduction. So we have the piston is conducting heat to the via the rings. ring so piston to conducts to the rings, rings and then it conducts to the solder wall conducts to the right so we have direct contact now conduction and radiation is uh, most simple because that is indirect from you just feel the heat coming off of something not the air blowing but just direct heat from it so that's your radiation like the sun The sun is in the giant gas ball thing in the yeah, sky, no, not, not my son, David. All right. Um, huh? Yes, not you. My son's name is David. <laughs> I saw him yesterday, so he's on my mind. <clears throat> All right. Uh, heat transferred. Uh -oh. a problem here. Hang on. We'll fix it. There we go. Heat uh, transferred from piston. So it goes from piston to rings, rings <coughs> to the okay cylinder wall to fins. cooling fins. Mm -hmm. And that's all. What kind of transfer? Conduction. Conduction. Okay. Um, then to the air and overboard. So the air passes through and overboard. In addition to that, <clears throat> we also have a different form of cooling going on. Well, it goes from the piston to oil. So from the piston to the oil, from the oil, possibly, to the oil cooler. Why do I say possibly? Not all oil goes to the oil cooler? That is true. Not all airplanes have an oil cooler. I heard that Larry's dead. Uh, yeah. They were, they were looking at the airplane. I asked him, I came in, I said, you know, have you figured it out? He's like, man, we took apart the oil. Because he had a, a problem about a year or so ago. And it, I think it became an airworthiness directive. Um, <clears throat> it's oil filter adapters on Continentals are notorious for coming loose. And uh, one style that he has had a bad gasket on it. It was a known problem, and it happened to him, and it blew out the gasket, and he lost a bunch of oil and did an emergency landing. So that was about a year ago. And so they were really suspect that that's where his problem was. And so I don't know, I just came in early and. I went to go look at the engine, but as luck would have it for me, I walked up and the engine's already off. 
and there's the airplane sitting there with nothing but an oil cooler on it that start with the oil cooler so the oil cooler sits on its firewall this way with the you know the air gun this way and has a scoop so the air comes in this way and down and i shine my flashlight and I'm like well the top of it looks fine i looked on the bottom the bottom's all oil soaked I'm like well if the air is coming through this way and the top is clean and the bottom is not that's not normal where did all this oil come from so i said man i think you know maybe there might be a, a rupture internal to this thing so do you see they took it apart it wasn't actually internal it was like on the side no. it only took a like you you put in two pounds of pressure it just the hole once you you pressurized it the holes is big around as the end of this pin not this part but that you know i could easily stick my pencil lead down it's huge hmm. it's i'm like wow so, <clears throat> all right. So, from piston oil, possibly oil cooler. Well, where does this oil come from that's going on the piston? <coughs> Excuse me. Inside the crank. Right. Well, there's not a lot of. There is some. There's definitely splash happening because the rods are going around the throw and that's spewing everywhere. And to some extent, that will do that. But. Um, I don't think Lycoming does this. Continental definitely does. Even on some of their small engines, they drill a hole in the in the rod cap, and it aims off to the side. So it aims off to because I told you this. They're oh, not yeah. cylinders are not opposing. It's off to the side, so it'll spray <coughs> over there. <clears throat> Lycoming doesn't do it that way. They do a little bit different. Piston cooling nozzles. So that's eighth inch pipe thread right there to give you an idea there. This is the, you know, where the cylinder bolts into and uh, I say it sprays across the other side. No, so yeah, it's going to sp spray into the, the back there. So, um, so you got the piston cooling nozzle right there. It's going to spray the cylinder. So there's an oil gallery behind here. So it's under pressure and just sprays to the back of the piston. Sometimes the piston has like a waffle, uh, look to the back of it like like a waffle <clears throat> but you don't put syrup on it you uh sprays oil back there and th those are like cooling fins on the back of the cylinder so that will spray the back of the piston piston cooling nozzles when you say back of the piston you mean literally the back the sides like or inside if i had a piston inside. i would show you it's okay. like Piston is right the here. Top, the other it's going top. back and forth. It's oh, going to spray just like that. Okay, the bottom. Yeah, the back, the bottom. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So some pistons, some, that's A. Some pistons have cooling fins. Some pistons. Cooling fins. Uh, under the head. Sometimes it looks like a waffle, a cross pattern. I've seen some that are just a row of, of cooling fins underneath there. Some don't. They don't have that at all. Um, some engines use cooling nozzles. Oops, let's see. B. Um, some engines have some engines. I'll just put spray oil to the back side. Of the piston so we'll have drilled rods either drilled rod caps or piston cooling nozzles will be the two ways of doing that <clears throat> Well, because we have this side load and it's it's a large piston and it's running up and down on the cylinder wall, uh, it must have a very good bearing characteristic. What's the bearing bore? Bearing bore what's the bore size of like a three fifty or a four fifty four? Or, you know, yeah. how much? Four. Okay, that's getting pretty big. Yeah, because most are about five inch. But most modern cars are about much smaller, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, excellent bearing characteristics. Uh, 
Um, let me see. So we have a lot of bearing surface on this piston. We have cylinder uh, to piston, cylinder wall to piston. I can say that cylinder wall. Right, that piston sliding up and down inside there, the skirt down the piston. We have the uh, piston pin boss, or piston pin to the boss. So we got the, the piston pin has to rotate around inside of that piston. So there's a bearing surface. Um, and we also have rings floating around in there. So a lot of bearing surface happening there on the piston itself. So let's talk a little bit about some parts of the piston. There we go. All right, some nomenclature, if you will. We've got, let me see. First thing I'm gonna talk about is, well, I can just talk about here. These are the lands. This land is my land. Land, um, so top land, another land, another land, another land. Down here is the skirt, as you can see, skirt from there to there. Um, top is the head. This part where the piston pin goes in, that's the piston pin boss. Anytime you have a, a hole that something goes in, that's usually referred to as the boss. Like you have the rocker shaft boss, piston pin boss. Uh, I, and I'll mention this more, but so in rings, this one has one, two, three, four. That's pretty unusual to see that configuration. When you see four rings like that, that's usually a very antique engine, an old radial engine. Most of the time you'll have three. So you'll have first, compression, then you'll have what's called second compression. So what that is, these two rings are compression rings, meaning their design is to keep the, the high pressure that's above the piston from going past it. Then you will have usually not that one, and then you'll have this one, and I picked this one because it has a little hole right there, uh, the oil ring. And then if you have a fourth one, you will have it down here below the piston pin, which will be, I call it the oil scraper. And we'll get more into that one right there. So, yeah, we'll get more into that. All right, what else we got here? Oops, I did not want to we'll do this. All right, so H. But I guess the first thing I'm going to talk about is the fact that pistons are cam ground. Now, what do you suppose that means? What's cam? It's not perfectly round. Yeah, your camshaft is not perfectly round, right? It's got lobes on it. So a cam ground piston means it is not perfectly round. It's oval, egg-shaped, if you will. So the cross section... Perpendicular. I'll write it. <laughs> Cross section is this is the worst way of saying it. Perpendicular is greater than in line with piston pin. Which is to say dimension uh, parallel to piston pin is smaller. That's a much nicer way to say it. All right, so why would the dimension that is parallel with the piston pin be smaller? Yes. Uh, room temp. Let's say that. That makes a big difference. All right, so remember how we talked a little bit already, and I'll go back into it, how cylinders are choked, mm -hmm. meaning that, and you've measured them, right? It's the same, it's the same, but when it gets down here, it gets smaller. 
up here in this area than it is right here at room temperature because there's more mass up here. You can see that. There's, there's more stuff. So more mass, when mass heats up, it expands at a greater rate. So when it's operating, it does this. Everything gets bigger, but it gets bigger up at the head faster so or greater. So it becomes straight when it's running. So same with the piston pin, or pist the piston, where they had to put all of that mass so that you could put a piston pin through. You have the piston pin boss and all that here. Now, the other side just have a little thin skirt. That's all there is. So that little thin skirt, it doesn't really expand as much as all that stuff with the piston pin. So where the piston pin goes, it's a little bit narrower. It heats up. It expands. So does the other part, but not as much. So by the time it's all done expanding, it is, in theory, a circle. Let me see. I'm going to write. There's three things on here, only two of which I believe. Rate of expansion is more with mass. So you're going to have a better fit. Better fit when engine is at temp. This one says allows more wear of the piston where thrust is the greatest. That's not true. It's going to thrust sideways. So the thrust is actually going to be on the top and the bottom when the piston goes this way. So I'm not going to write that one. And then there was something else that I was going to say there, but I forgot what it was. Hmm. Rate of expansion, more with mass, better fit. Oh, yeah. So we've got two things that we know about right now that are going to change when the engine gets warmer. One, cylinder is going to do what? Straighten. They expand and straighten. straighten. And the piston is going to expand, expand, expand and straighten. And so yeah. it just bugs the crap out of me when I see people with cold engines get in there and just start them up and go to high power setting because I know those cylinders are choked out. You know, and uh, I'll write this in a minute. Um, a lot of these pistons now have steel belts up in that top ring uh, land, not the top, but the next one down. Both sides of the, um, I'm thinking about it, both sides of the top compression because there's so much pressure from the air hitting that first ring, it forces it down. And so when it forces it down against the aluminum, it tends to wear faster. And sometimes you get big gaps wore out in these pistons, a lot of aluminum in the engine too. So they put a ring around there, steel ring around there, so it's steel against steel. So now you've got a steel ring in there trying to force its way up into a piston, a cylinder that's really choked out. It's like, oh, that can't be good for anything. How many minutes do you suggest idling the engine before you? Uh, okay, so the, uh, the Rotax in the... Um, not Pipistrol. God, I can never remember the name of that stupid airplane that fly over. Not a stupid airplane, it's a cool airplane. Um, anyway, it, it's uh, one of the ones I worked on um, over at JetX that they use for trainers. They use the Rotax, and everything in there is a glass cockpit, and it actually will not change. It actually changes the red line or yellow line on the RPM until it's at temperature. So you actually have to sit there and run it for quite a while until it, the green line switches to allow you to go to higher RPM. And that takes about more than five minutes. A good five, yeah, At five. least a good five. I wait until my oil pressure shows an indication and gets up to about 100 degrees. So you're not going to get a lot of cylinder head temp. I mean, when you're idling. They just don't get too terribly hot. You're not going to see. Huh? No, thank you, though. That would be one of them. I said Pipistrol, that one, and that's what I always go to. It's not. I'll figure it out. Huh? And then I'll forget again. Yeah. All right. Uh, balance. We talked about balance before. Balance. Uh, each piston should weigh no more than... Then... Uh, I'm going to hate myself for doing this quarter ounce per um, textbook 
So I have a textbook that says quarter ounce. So that's why I said per textbook. So um, TCM, that's continental, uh, states how much? One half ounce max. That's how many grams? Hey, bunch of druggies in here. <laughs> oh, well. Why else would you know ounces, man? That's, no, I know. It's a trick. <laughs> All right, types of pistons. You know, and as I go through this, and we have the, all the different types of pistons and everything else, you know, the funny thing is, it doesn't matter what it, you call it, it doesn't matter what type it is, you don't have to know this stuff to be a, just, a, just a tremendously good aircraft mechanic. Because you're going to put in the piston that belongs in the engine. And that requires that you understand the engine, you understand parts books, you understand service bulletins and, you under, and, and service instructions, and that you know the progression of engines and you pay attention. It's really all it is, just paying really good attention. Um, you know, if you're building up an engine, and I always say, don't ever trust the last person, but if what you're doing doesn't match, I want data, right? So. I think it's this, that person thought it's that. One of us is clearly wrong, and it, you know I will verify that it's not me. So double check, triple check if something doesn't look off. Um, funny enough, the one area where there is a problem in aviation with the wrong piston, and I don't know why this is, it's the Continental uh, 550s. So a Continental, 550 is almost exactly like a 520 in so many ways. Uh, same bore, so the piston fits, but it has a different stroke. And the piston comes a little bit longer of a, a throw on the crankshaft, so the piston comes back just a little bit more, and there's gotta be a little bit of clearance between that and the crankshaft coming up, and if you don't have the right piston, and the only difference I think between the pistons is they milled out a little flat spot on the back of the 550s. So if you put a 520 piston in, it will work wonderfully going forward. It will hit on the way back. So as we say, it'll either wear in or wear out. Well, this particular one will wear in. So it beats itself against the crankshaft as it comes back until it works. And then, then after that, you're fine. Don't worry about it. So, but we'll talk about the different types of pistons. We have the flat piston. I think I have pictures. There we go. I don't, that says slipper type, but it makes, I can't see what they're trying to show me there. That doesn't actually help me at all. Um, we've got the, uh, let's see, recessed head. Oh yeah, because it's got a little, it's a terrible picture, recessed head. Flat, of course, is just flat. Recessed head. Um, this is, I think what they're trying to show right here, the recessed head. You can see that's where, I'll make it a little bigger. The valve, it actually clear, a little clearance for the valve to come down right there. Recessed head. Oh, there's a better picture. Recessed head. Yeah, what well, is what they're trying to show me. All right. And you can see they're also like this. So that'd be an angle head, which I guess I could bring up the fact that when we talk about cylinders, you'll almost always talk about parallel versus angle head. Well, not always. Light combing. In the light combing world, you talk about angle heads versus parallel heads. Not in Continental, they, they don't do that. Um, Continental, like all of the 65, 75, 85, 90s, 200s, 300s, they're all, they look like that, parallel. Everything is going par parallel. Um, 360s and on up, they're all angled. And what that means is you can't put one rocker shaft all the way through. They have two rocker shafts because they're at an angle and the pistons, the valves are going this way. So when you get into Lycoming, they have the 320, 290, and 235, like you guys are working on. They're parallel, like that, right? One rocker shaft. And then you get into, as soon as you get into 360s, they made 360s with parallel, and they made 360s with angle. And they made 540s with parallel, and they made 540s with angle. So it's like, okay, you gotta know which one you're working on. But I will say that's a good time for a break. Break.